to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there. How are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast brought to you by Kraken. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I have the fourth interview in my Mount Gox series, an interview with Kim Nilsson, the author of the Wyzek Report, Cracking Mount Gox. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsors. So let's talk about my new sponsor, Kraken, again. I've already told you over the last few days why I wanted to work with them, why I love them so much. I'm not going to be using my Coinbase account anymore. I, do you know what? I haven't actually used that in a long time anyway, but I want to get behind Kraken and support them as they've got behind the podcast and supported me and you know, Chessie's been supporting me for quite a long time. And maybe it's time for you lot to look at Kraken again. When was the last time you looked at it? Did you go and have a look at the design, as I said to you yesterday? There's a number of things about Kraken which really stand out. Firstly, they've had a real focus on security. I've looked into this with them, actually, and discussed it quite a bit. Security is absolutely central to what Kraken does. So you've got a huge amount of peace of mind if you're trading with Kraken. They also allow for margin and futures trading. That's not something I do, but now a lot of you do. So it might be worth checking out their product and you can get fees as low as 0%. So it's probably time for you to go and revisit Kraken. Check them out at kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. And what about BlockFi? Have you checked them out yet? Come on, I've been talking about them for a long time. If you are interested in a crypto back loan, well, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender. They service customers worldwide, including 47 US states, and their interest rates start as low as 4.5%. Also, BlockFi accepts Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin as collateral. Customers can be funded in USD or GUSD, which is Gemini's dollar-backed stablecoin, and you can go from application to funding in as little as 30 minutes. Take advantage of the offer. If you sign up at BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000 and apply and takes less than two minutes. That is BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. So on to my interview with Kim. And it was somebody else who made me aware of the report he had authored prior to interviewing Jed, actually. And if you haven't read the report, I suggest you do. It's in the show notes. I've also included a presentation from Kim where he talks through it. The report does an excellent job of breaking down the chain of events on the exchange, which led to its collapse from the Liberty Reserve hack prior to Mark taking over Mt. Gox, all the way through to the primary theft of 650,000 Bitcoin from the compromised hot wallet. It really is an interesting report and it was definitely worth getting Kim on to talk about this. So if you have any questions about this interview, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And listen, if you enjoy these Mt. Gox interviews and you want to support the show, please head over to my website. It's www.whatbitcoindid.com and there's a section called support. Click on there. It can tell you everything you can do. And I also need to thank my patron top tier sponsor. Make sure you check out vidyen.com who create open source plugins which you can use to reward users with virtual items or store credit when they mine crypto in their browser or on your WordPress site. That is vidyen.com, which is V-I-D-Y-E-N.com. Okay, so on to the interview. I hope you enjoy it. As I said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Good evening, Kim. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Actually, it's not even evening for you, is it? It's some ridiculous hour. It's Yeah, it's early morning for me. Okay, so thank you anyway for coming on. Obviously, you're aware of my work this week. I've been trying to navigate a lot of the kind of big rabbit hole for Mt. Gox, and I almost could do all these interviews again afterwards because I, you know, I learn a lot more. Um, but I wanted to talk to you because I was made aware of your work by somebody else, actually, not not involved directly in Mt. Gox a while ago. Um, I never really looked at it, but I've obviously with my research for this, I've been looking through it in detail. But for a good starting point, it would be great for you just to introduce yourself, tell people what you do, how you came to be involved with what's going on in Mt. Gox. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, I'm just a normal software developer, really, honest. I was a customer at Mt. Gox in 2012, 2013. was trading a little bit, checking out Bitcoin. Got caught up in the Mt. Gox collapse in 2014. Lost a fair amount of money uh, and was very annoyed as a result. Uh, and I figured that, well, I wasn't necessarily confident that uh, law enforcement or just the system would be able to crack this case because... It was Bitcoin. It was very new technology. I was not expecting at all there to be any Bitcoin blockchain experts in, in the Japanese police department or anything. So the thought kind of started appearing that uh, it's Bitcoin, it's blockchain, it's it's a public ledger of all transactions. Wouldn't 
there be an opportunity for someone to look at this completely from the outside and do sort of an independent investigation, just looking at the numbers on the ledger. And it sort of started from there in that I got together with some friends at the time and, and started exploring angles. Uh, we were based here in Japan, so that was convenient, and close to close to the first party sources and things like that. And yeah, basically that started a journey that then lasted for over three years of me sitting in my spare time, uh, figuring out the numbers, trying to gather up more data from Mt. Gox and trying to figure out what had happened, basically. Okay, and just for transparency, obviously today I released an episode with Daniel Kelman, and I've also seen a Wall Street Journal article where you're having, I think, apple pie in Mark Carpellis's, uh kitchen. So it's probably good for transparency to explain your relationship or previous interactions with both. Okay, so Daniel Kelman is one of the people that I got together with in 2014 to, to work on this stuff. Daniel is a lawyer, so he's he was exploring more of the legal angles at the time and has kept doing so throughout the years. Uh, I'm obviously much more of a tech guy, so I was doing the technical investigation and working on the blockchain. Obviously, as uh, the main target of us being in Japan was to try to get hold of Mark himself at the time, uh, to see, like, can you share data with us? Can you help us with this investigation? Uh, so a lot of the time was, has been spent like approaching, getting to know Mark, uh, getting him to try to share some, yeah, basically information that I can use in my technical research, try to share more of the backstory that we can use to piece the puzzle, pu- uh, piece the puzzle together. Uh, but so yeah, basically, I know Mark decently well by now. I know Daniel well by now. Uh, so it's it's not a huge world. Uh, we you know each other decently well. I have had the apple pie. It's pretty good. How open was Mark to working with you? How transparent? Was he difficult in any way? In the beginning, he wasn't open to it at all. Very, very guarded. Uh, had a poker face on. Uh, Mark's poker face is somewhat amazing in that uh, he had obviously had the exchanges collapse down on him. And in retrospect, now we know that he was involved with some uh, some less than honorable stuff about running Willy, the exchange bot, and things like that. But at the time we spoke to him, that he was complete blank face, and I couldn't read him at all. And it was really, really hard to get close to him to get him to share information. He was very guarded. He didn't want to share anything in case that got him in trouble and things like that. And I kept at it over the years, and and. Basically, it stayed that way until around the time when he went to uh, went to jail, basically. Right. Okay. Which is, yeah, which was years later, almost. Okay, so I've been through the report. It is fascinating, and I've actually seen you present it as well. And it's the information is fascinating. It goes over my head quite a bit. But what was the incentive for you to produce the report? Well, the incentive was that I wanted to know the answer. Uh, the report was more of a side effect that, oh, hey, I think I figured it out. I'd better tell someone. Uh, initially, I found most of the things that I've put in my report, like quite a bit earlier, some of it years earlier, some uh, just in the preceding year before I went public with it. Uh, I did cooperate a fair amount with law enforcement and then feed information to them, figuring that whoever was behind this, they would have better chances to, to get at them. Uh, so basically the reports came at the end of a long personal journey that was mostly mostly me not being satisfied until I had convinced myself that I understood what had happened to Monk Ox and by extension my money. Right, because you were also a creditor. Sorry, I didn't ask that question. Yeah, yeah, I, I was a, a creditor. Not a, not a huge creditor, but it was definitely enough for me to be annoyed at the time. Okay, and... On retrospect now, it would be good, before we start going into this, if you can give me a kind of picture of your feelings and opinions on both Jed and Mark having, you know, gone through the research. Uh, Okay, Uh, I guess maybe start with Mark, since he's the obvious guy in the center of everything. Uh, I got into the investigation basically figuring that Mark was probably the bad guy. Maybe he had cooked the numbers. Maybe there were no Bitcoins that had gone missing. Like uh, My initial theory was that, as some other people were theorizing as well at the time, that maybe the Bitcoins never existed. Maybe it was all this exchange spot that he had been running that messed up the accounting. Uh, 
eventually over time, as I've worked more on the case, it became more obvious that no, there actually was a theft of Bitcoin. And I sort of had to readjust my attitude a bit towards Mark as well and recognize that, all right, he wasn't completely guilty of everything that people are accusing him of. Uh, these days, I have a more neutral opinion of him. Uh, I still think he did a lot of things wrong. Uh, it's easy to look back and hold people perfectly accountable and have 2020 vision and say that you oh you should obviously have done this. But there there are some mitigating circumstances. I feel uh, doesn't excuse everything. But these days, Mark uh, is at least seems to be trying to do the right thing and, and repair what he can. Uh, as for Jed, I haven't spoken with Jed myself. I have very limited exposure to him. Uh, I only know him through Mt. Gox, basically, uh, in that I've done the research. I've tried to figure out what happened even in the early days. It seems that when Mt. Gox was initially made, even more so than while Mark was running it, it was more of a tech experiment, uh, just something put together to see if, if, it, if he could build it. Uh, so with that in mind, it's not terribly surprising if the code wasn't, wasn't built very solid or uh, had security holes in it or whatnot. Uh, what has been slightly striking, though, is that in the grander scheme of things, uh, people have gone after Mark to a very large degree, and, and he's been in jail, etc. And people are obviously hating him a lot online as well. But a lot of the problems that plagued Mt. Gox and some of the early financial issues were more, they were kind of definitely caused by or at least under Jed's management. And Jed has been able to sort of walk away from the whole thing relatively unscathed and not even losing any money in it. So, in that sense, I guess, I guess uh, it's, it's slightly unsatisfying to see blame sort of apportioned a bit unevenly, I guess. So let me tell you my defense of both of them, because I've tried to give them both the benefit of the doubt. And one thing that has been a kind of a constant through these interviews, which I've raised with each guest, is that I think perhaps people look back at the timeline with 2017, 2018, 2019 eyes, where we have a much more mature ecosystem, more experience of how to run these exchanges, and a network worth tens if not hundreds of billions and a bitcoin worth thousands so when i look back at jed i see he created the first exchange i think at the time when he launched it bitcoin was six cents and it had i think a couple of thousand users on the site and within six months he'd kind of got rid of it so i almost see his contribution to mount gox whilst he contributed something that maybe did have faults it feels more like a bedroom project than any serious business so that's kind of my defense of Jed. And um, my defense of Mark is he took over the first exchange. It seems to me like he was more a combination of, I don't want to say incompetent because I don't want to be totally unfair, but out of his depth, digging a bigger hole and didn't probably have the necessary business or technical skills to navigate himself out of this hole that seemed to get a lot bigger. So that's my defense of both of them. How do you feel about that? I, I think I would agree with most of what you're saying. Uh, like you say, when like you said, when Mt. Gox was created by Jed, definitely a hobby project. Created something that nothing like this really existed before, and Jed made it. So that's a big achievement. Uh, of course, it would have been even better if it was flawless and perfect from the start, but things tend not to be. Uh, so I'm not trying to detract in any way from Jed's accomplishment in that area. Uh, it's, it's more... Uh, uh, a matter of did you really hand this off in the way that you should have? Do you, do you do you not feel any responsibility for the things that were broken when you handed them over? Uh, uh, with Mark, yeah, uh, it's really really hard to summarize that person. Uh, like you say, definitely out of his depth. Uh, too much responsibility on on one person's shoulders, I think. Uh, maybe most of us would break under the, in the same way under the same circumstances. I don't know. I would like to think that I would have been able to make a harder decision and go public as soon as I knew there were any trouble with the exchange, for example. But I don't know how I, would, how I really would have acted in the same situation. Uh, 
so yeah, I mean, I, I can come up with ways to defend Mark uh, because it was clearly not a uh, what's the word? It was clearly not an enviable situation that he was put in, uh, but also with great power comes great responsibility, I guess. Uh, yeah, having met him myself. I like the guy, I've got to be honest, I did. I thought he was very welcoming. He seemed honest. One of my comments on my previous interview with him was that, you know, whether he's lied, which he may have or probably has at times, I think sometimes there's a certain amount of self-preservation that goes on in a situation like this. I can't imagine anyone being 100% honest with the truth through such a situation because, you know, there's multiple excuses that you may have in your head and like I say there's a certain amount of self-preservation what I did find with Mark is that based on my experience my limited experience in running companies he didn't seem like the kind of guy who should be running a company he seemed like the kind of guy who should be working for somebody running the company who has maybe the experience and skills necessary to build like a structure and to deal with complex disaster scenarios and it seems like he suddenly went from having a probably a company that turned over maybe a couple hundred thousand in kind of profit to something that was suddenly was holding hundreds of millions in value and I don't even know myself how I would handle such growth but it seems like it grew quicker than he was able to deal with does that make sense yeah uh it, it makes perfect sense uh and it, it absolutely did Mt. Gox exploded and became a huge success story on the surface at least uh I don't know many companies that can handle that. Even if you have the best possible team and you're prepared to scale up instantly, that's a hard thing to deal with. And if you're just one guy or a few guys, it's it's bound to be almost impossible to do. Uh, when we look back on everything now, of course we can see all the mistakes being made, but at the time it was probably just trying to deal the hand that life dealt him. Uh, he, he, we can definitely say that he played it poorly at times, uh, but I don't know. How, I don't know how I would have done it in the same in, if I were in his shoes. Uh, so yeah, from a human perspective, I can definitely understand what he did. Uh, I think I would be dishonest if I said that I would have had the same impulse to maybe try to cover some of it up and try to save Mangox behind the scenes secretly instead of coming clean and saying you know something awful has happened. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we expect more from people in this position. That's that's why they're in. You, that's why we usually put people in these elevated positions to be able to make the right decisions. And Mark kind of ended up there more by accident. Okay, so let's go through the investigation because, like I say, it is fascinating. It, most of it goes way over my head. So, can you talk to me about where you started? Like, what was the starting point? Because there's there's a timeline of different types of hacks, but there's also the looking at the hacks themselves. Did you? Did you start with the primary, like the big siphoning off of Bitcoin from the main wallet, or did you did you start from uh, the very start when Jed handed over? Tell me your timeline of activity. Well, my timeline is I didn't know any of these things when I started. I, uh, we, I only knew what everyone else knew, that Mt. Gox apparently had no money. And it was 650,000 or 750,000 or 850,000 Bitcoins missing. That was That was all that anyone ever knew. Uh, in early 2014, uh, there was a data leak where someone who had seemingly hacked into Mt. Gox and gotten hold of them, some of their accounting records, I think, published that online. And suddenly there were some records about uh, some of their trading logs, like uh, which people traded Bitcoins with which people, uh, and as well as some Bitcoin deposits and withdrawals. And based on that, there was another researcher uh, that wrote was what's what's called the Willy Report, which was basically the first person to identify in terms of data that there was an seemed to be an internal trading bot on Mt. Gox that was trading money and was doing trading money in Bitcoin and doing it at such a volume that it would almost have to be faked uh, using not real money and just inventing Bitcoins or inventing dollars. And that wasn't even the first time people had started noticing this. Already in 2013, some people were seeing that live when they were watching Mt. Gox trades uh, online. Uh, just seeing that hey, there seems to be someone executing trades at regular intervals or whatnot. 
So the fact that that data leaked and then that someone was able to analyze it and, and make some news out of it, that sort of became the real starting point for me to get started as well. To because at that point I figured, all right, I have no excuse. Clearly, it's possible to find out things based on the material that's available to the public. And I get and I got started with this, uh, basically trying to replicate his findings, uh, the the author of the Will report. And I tried to replicate what he had done and come to the same conclusion that yes, there's an internal trading bot. Uh, and and further, I tried to look a bit closer and see that. It's probably based in the same time zone as Japan. Uh, it's uh, find, uh, finding like a few extra details like that. So basically, that was my starting angle. I didn't know anything about specific incidents that had happened at Mt. Gox or anything. I just knew that coins were missing. This was the only early lead. Let's see what I can find with that. Uh, so, yeah, I was able to replicate the report. I got a bit further. This is where we started approaching Mark as well to see if we can get a bit more information and, and possibly more data about Mt. Gox to, to sort of take the next step and try to basically identify were there then any leaks of Bitcoins. Uh, like is the, was the wallet handling uh, appropriate for Mt. Gox? Did it actually send out Bitcoins for all the withdrawals, or were there more Bitcoins being sent out than there were legitimate withdrawals? Those were the sort of questions that I really wanted to answer, and that required a lot of data processing on my end, and also uh, I needed to get closer to Mark and get him to help, basically, help me verify that what I'm finding and reconstructing is actually in the right direction in terms of, at least in terms of being able to reconstruct the original data. Okay. So. Yeah, that was basically this. So that's how my investigation sort of started. I, I I was initially convinced it was just internal trading or something that was responsible, and then I had sort of had to widen my horizons a bit, try to get a hold of more data, and and start looking more at the technical aspect of it, and then following the blockchain and seeing were there any coins being taken out of the Montox wallet. Okay, well, let's work through the timeline because one of the things that's quite interesting in your report, which I will share out in the show notes, is you have that pinned note that totals the losses over time. And I think that gives a very good reflection of a deepening crisis. Let's start with the first one. And this was pre-Mark. This was the Liberty Reserve withdrawal exploit, which was essentially handed to Mark, therefore, as a an exchange with a $50,000 deficit, right? Right. So, yeah, uh, in the initial handover between Jed and Mark, this was one of the hacks that had already happened that was known, and the uh, the sales agreement accounted for it and basically said we'll, uh, that Jed would hand over all the holdings of Mt. Gox, but that would be defined as all customer deposits minus the 50000 that had been taken out from this hack. And does that mean he is operating insolvent? Uh, I don't know if he would have had enough money to cover that missing fifty thousand, but if you are accepting like customer deposits and you are not able to pay all of them back, if all the customers would have asked for it at the time, then yes, I believe you're technically insolvent. Okay, I'll skip the next uh, Liberty Reserve exploit because that was returned. I think one of the most interesting things that I would love to get to the bottom of was the theft of the eighty thousand Bitcoin because at the time, you know. Bitcoin wasn't worth a lot, but if those Bitcoins weren't replaced and the price suddenly shoots up, that becomes a kind of a real crisis point. And from my both my interviews, it seems to me that that theft happened during what was considered the handover period. So can you talk about what happened there and what you found? All right. So I don't know to 100% exactly what would happen because I've only heard both sides of it. Uh but basically, around the time when Mt. Gox was due to be handed over, uh, with Jed gradually giving Mark access to all the stuff, sometime during that period, uh, someone, uh, some hackers seem to be able, seem to have gotten into the server, got access to the uh, the hot wallet, which is just a wallet dot that file, the original Bitcoin software, copy that off, and then basically uh, move the funds. And Jed notices this and kind of messages Mark and says, hey, there's a problem. All the money is gone, basically. And I wouldn't pretend to know all of the details from that, but apparently, I mean, 
the end result is for some reason that they still go through with a handover and Mark doesn't ever publicly call Jed out on this, uh, which is, that's always seemed a little bit weird to me. Like, why would you take still go through with a deal and take over the exchange when the terms change so drastically on the eve of the handover? Uh, I know that there are emails later where where Jed is making some suggestions about how you could possibly recover this by by sort of injecting additional investment into the company or shifting the debt into dollars so that it doesn't go up if the Bitcoin price goes up, etc. Uh, so they were clearly both aware that the money was missing and that it was a problem, but for some reason they both figured that it's something that they could keep quiet and just try to recover in, in secret. I guess because the price was so low then that those 80,000 Bitcoin, I think Jed said to me, were worth like eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 or whatever the price was. It's not such a problem at that point, but when the price shoots up, say 10x, 15, 20x, whatever it does, it becomes a real problem because the dollar debt is a lot higher, right? Exactly, yes. So, uh, so at the time when the theft happened, I think the Bitcoin price was pretty close to like a dollar or something. So uh, in rough numbers, the 80,000 Bitcoins would have been around $80,000. But just a few months later, around June, that was the first Bitcoin price spike where the, the price was suddenly $30 for Bitcoin. And then this, these 80,000 Bitcoins is suddenly a huge amount of money that the, the company absolutely doesn't have any coverage for. So so yes, it could it could very quickly become a problem, and it did very quickly become a problem. And is this around the same time that Willybot starts? So the Willybot is sort of a collective term for all of the manipulations, so to speak. There were two generations of the Willybot that Mark was running. Uh, one was done manually, and that started later in 2011, I think. And then in, in late in 2013, he also made the automated version, which is the one that was noticed in public. Uh, but even before that, there 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 have been a few bot accounts also created, but I don't know or I don't believe that they were created for this purpose or to uh, to recover from debt. But there existed additional accounts that were being used to to keep like money that had been uh, seized from fraudulent customers and things like that. Okay, am I right in thinking the eighty thousand Bitcoin that was stolen? They've never moved since they've been stolen, right? Yeah, that's correct. They're, they're still sitting in the same address. that They were moved out of the hot wallet and then moved to that one new address, and they're still sitting there today. Does that make you suspicious in any way? I don't know. Uh, if, if I stole the Bitcoins, even if I was convinced that someone was watching the coins, I would think that some at some point in the next five years, I would try to move them if I could, uh, try to come up with some way to launder them. So the fact that they haven't moved might suggest that the thief lost the private key? Yeah, perhaps. I don't know. Okay, so let's move on to May. Another 300,000 Bitcoin was uh, stolen. Talk me through this, because they were stored on a unsecure private network drive. Talk me through what you found out about this. So basically, uh, this was not a publicly known theft at any point. I found the transactions while I was investigating, and then Mark sort of told me the, the background story behind what had happened. And basically, at the time, uh, this was sort of early after the initial transition period where, st- where he's still sort of making changes to all the code and sort of you know, making all the improvements and touch-ups after taking over everything from Jed. And at that point in time, he was apparently keeping a ton of the Bitcoins in a uh, private wallet that he just kept on his own computer. And the story he gave me is that at one point, one day, uh, his home network router broke down. And to get access back to the internet again, he just hooked up his main computer straight to it without any firewalls on it. At which point, someone just randomly happened to notice that, hey, there's this private network with a computer on it with a shared network drive for his home profile with a Bitcoin wallet on it. I'll just help myself to that. And suddenly, 300,000 Bitcoins are gone. And the only reason why Mt. Gox didn't crash then and there is that Whoever this thief was, they probably weren't probably weren't the most experienced because they got cold feet and, and contacted Mark and offered to give the coins back if they could just keep a small uh, keep a small fee basically. So that's uh, the one percent keepers fee. Did you ever try and track what happened to those three thousand Bitcoin? Uh, I've done some tracking of them, not not too far. Uh, it was never 
it never felt like the top priority of, of my investigation, but they can be tracked a bit further if anyone wants to. And I guess at that point, if that person hadn't returned the coins, that probably might have been the end of Mount Gox then. Oh, definitely, yes. I mean, uh, remember that this is just after, just two months after the uh, the first theft of the 80,000 bitcoins. Mt. Gox had become quite popular at this point, so it was still raking in tons of new deposits, but this was still like the majority of all the coins that it was holding at the time. And I guess that's an early indication that the internal security procedures aren't great and kind of one of the areas that is inexcusable. Yeah, I mean, even if Bitcoin is only worth, uh, I don't know what it was worth at the time, like 2 or $3 dollars. That's still a million dollars you were having on your computer for other people's money. You would think that you would be a bit more cautious about it. So, yeah, it clearly suggests uh, not the kind of mindset you would want to watch over other people's money, I guess, if you're able to make seemingly thoughtlessly make a mistake like that. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to June. There's another hack. This time someone's gained access to Jed's admin account. Talk me through this, what happened here. So basically, one of the weaknesses on uh, Jed's first implementation of the exchange was that all the all the user passwords were stored with just a weak hash that was unsalted, which is a technical term that basically just means that if hackers get into the system and are able to copy your user's table, it's much simpler for them to start cracking passwords. Uh, salting passwords is basically a method where you make it much harder for hackers to crack those hashes. But in Jed's version, it was just a simple MB5 hash with no salting. And there's very strong reasons to believe that this user's table was compromised and taken out at some previous point in time. What happened in June was that eventually someone did crack Jed's password from this user's table and was just, and was then able to get into his user account on Mt. Gox. And Jed's user account still had admin privileges. Uh, I don't know if that was intentional like a, a, as part of the uh, sales agreement, but part of the admin privileges of Mt. Gox is that you're able to mani- freely manipulate any the balance of any account. So whoever got into this, got into his account, made use of this feature, and started adding tons of coins to other people's accounts and just selling them on the open market. And that crashed the price down to nothing. So at this point, we're at 85,000 Bitcoin missing. We're at $50,000 missing. Have you done any audit alongside this to see what the balance was of, say, Mt. Gox's owned Bitcoin? Like, did they have 85000 themselves to cover? Uh, I haven't done, like, a total analysis of how much they would have accumulated in fees. Uh, but my opinion is that they would not have had nearly enough to cover any of this, not even close at any point in time. Next up, I'll talk to Kim more about his investigation into Mt. Gox, but before that, I have a message from my show sponsors. So, with BlockFi this week, I wanted to remind you of some of the most important things about them and why I am such a big fan, not only because they're a sponsor. I do get lots of companies approaching me, and the majority get rejected because they're not the kind of company I want sponsoring the podcast, and I maybe don't believe in what they're doing. I'm a big fan of BlockFi. I also had the CEO, Zach Prince, on. I'm not sure if you ever listened to that episode. It was episode 51. Definitely check it out. It's a really good episode. We could talk about the future of crypto and banking, something BlockFi is certainly part of. And for me as a business owner, I had an absolute nightmare trying to get a business account. I think it took me about eight months and I was rejected by, I think, six high street banks. Everyone saying no because my business touched Bitcoin. Stupid, really. Well, in the future, companies like BlockFi are going to simplify this process of getting bank services natively built with Bitcoin. And that's just one of the things I love about BlockFi. So if you are interested in a crypto back loan, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender, servicing customers worldwide, including 47 US states, and their interest rates start as low as 4.5%. If you sign up at BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000 and applying takes less than two minutes. So you know the drill. Check out BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. And what about the mighty Cash App? Have you checked it out yet? They're a new sponsor of mine. They supported me going out to Japan to interview Mark Harpellis. Big fans of them. Got a lot of love for what they're doing. 
not only because they were so responsive about me heading out to Japan, but they're a proper Bitcoin company. They're a Bitcoin only company. You gotta love a Bitcoin only company, right? So have you got the Cash App? Have you downloaded it yet? Have you checked it out? Have you got it on your iPhone? I've got it on mine. Cash App is the first traditional peer-to-peer -peer payments app to support Bitcoin. It comes with most of the features of a traditional bank account. You've got the ability to direct deposit your paycheck into the app. You have a linked physical customizable debit card which you can spend from and you can earn 10% cash back at places like Whole Foods with your cash boosts that can be used in tandem with your Bitcoin balance. There's no app out there quite like it. And if you want to buy Bitcoin from them, the experience of buying and selling Bitcoin could not be easier. Literally, it requires only two clicks and you'll receive your Bitcoin instantly. They are definitely committed to supporting the Bitcoin ecosystem. You've probably seen all the stuff that Jack's been doing on Twitter. You gotta love Cash App. You gotta check them out. Go and download the app now. It's available on the Apple and Google app stores. You can download by searching for Cash App, which is C-A-S-H-A-P-P. -P. Definitely go and check out Cash App. Okay, so then we move on to August, and for some reason, Mark decides to acquire Bitermat and absorb their debts, which was 17,000 Bitcoin. Has he talked about this to you and why he did that? Uh, not to great depth, uh, but uh, basically at the time, Mark Gox was looking for some sort of a foothold in the European market. You have to, I didn't necessarily want to go through all the paperwork of getting local permits. Uh, so I think Mark at the time saw it as an opportunity that bit or match was an exchange that was already established in Europe. They had some of the permits that Mt. Gox would have needed to legally operate and figured, all right, we'll just take you guys over. We'll swallow your debts in exchange for just uh, taking over your company and running with your licenses. Uh, I don't know if it ended up being worth it. I mean, 17,000 bitcoins at today's prices was certainly a healthy payout for 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 that company uh but at the time yeah it was just uh, it seems like just been something that mark did to to try to keep the company afloat and expanding and then we move on to september and there's another significant hack so database is compromised the hacker gets read write access to the database inflates account balances and seventy seven and a half thousand bitcoin is withdrawn yeah so what did you find out about this and were you able to track where this went because this is quite a significant amount at that time yeah so this is actually the last thefts that were being that were identified as part of my investigation at least uh they, they were the hardest to find because they uh, the thieves at this time actually erased uh, the evidence they created temporary user accounts in the Montcox database but then wiped it after they were done so it was much harder to uncover what had actually happened here even with the cooperation of mark um basically these funds took a different route uh, they're listed in the uh, in the graph i made for my presentation uh, about where the stolen mancox money went uh so they get laundered through a different wallet network they still end up at largely the same destination points because uh which were btc and trade hill which were the main exchanges used for money laundering at the time so I don't necessarily know if there's any strong connection between this and the later main theft, uh, but the money is one way or another, the money ended up taking similar channels at least after they were stolen. Right. So let's talk about the main theft, the 630,000 Bitcoin stolen from the hot wallet. It's fascinating, but even watching your presentation, I didn't fully understand it. And I think there are other people who might struggle with it. So talk me through what you found, what the hacker did how Mark missed it. But if you can try and make it as easy to understand as possible, that would be great because <laughs> it is complicated. You are asking a lot of me, sir. Uh, it's, it's not, easy, it's not easy to explain this. And it isn't, it's not easy to explain this in an easy way, but basically what I did was after I did been able to get hold of and reconstruct enough data about the Mt. wallet and their lists of Bitcoin deposits and withdrawals, I was able to start comparing that to the wallet as it existed on the blockchain with the full list of transactions that actually happened. And comparing those two, eventually I started seeing a pattern where there were additional transactions of a fairly regular pattern where a couple of hundred thousand bit, not, sorry, not a hundred thousand, a couple of hundred bitcoins at a time were being taken out of the hot wallet. It looked just like a withdrawal, except it wasn't logged anywhere. Uh, so, 
these went off into other sources and I started I later started tracking where the money actually went but for the time being uh, the the first step was just noticing that this was happening and it was happening over a long period of time what what actually caused this was that hackers again had gotten into the servers and they copied the Bitcoin wallet file as it existed at the time, uh, which would let them spend any Bitcoin that existed in any address that had been created at the time, because a wallet is nothing but a collection of your private keys. As you use your wallet, you will typically create more and more private keys. So stealing your wallet at one point in time when with this sort of first generation wallet means that the thief can spend anything, but only the Bitcoins that you have in your oldest addresses, basically. And that's what kept happening to Mt. Gox in that over time, as customers were slowly depositing more and more coins in, any coins that were deposited into an old address could be stolen by the thieves. So next step of that is figuring out where the hell that went, uh, which basically means doing a lot of clustering, uh, which means grouping according to which addresses are likely belonging to the same person and wallet. Uh, and most, if not all, of the money stolen in this way went to the same small set of wallets. And from there, it was being deposited back onto exchanges again, which is probably for selling off or laundering in some way. Uh, my suspicion is that it was just for selling, because that made, that would have made more sense at the time. No one would be betting in 2011 that Bitcoin is going to go to $20,000 in 2018, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, so I got sort of a, a rough picture of this coin flow from Mt. Gox and going into other sh- other exchanges, including Mt. Gox itself, interestingly. Uh, so whoever stole the money and gave them to this person for money laundering, they were trying to launder it back through Mt. Gox again. And that was interesting because Mt. Gox was something I actually had some internal information about. I could actually see which accounts were being used on the Mt. Gox side to receive those stolen funds again. So that basically became uh, the the foothold for the rest of the investigation, trying to connect this to some actual person. And after lots of trial and error and, and just trying to track where all of this is going, uh, I got some leads to a guy online that was complaining about his funds being seized as he had deposited them to an exchange called Crypto Exchange. Was that Vinic? Yeah, that's Vinic. So he'd put a bunch of Bitcoins into into Crypto Exchange to sell them off. But then Crypto Exchange sort of said uh, that they wouldn't honor the, his withdrawal request and they just ended up sort of keeping the money. And what happened behind the scenes was that, ironically, that money, that, that stolen money, the Bitcoins had actually come from the theft of Bitcoinica which was another exchange at the time that got hacked. And this guy, the money launderer, Vinick, was trying to launder those funds as well. But when he put them into crypto exchange, crypto exchange was actually relying on Mt. Gox as sort of one of their backends to 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 use, uh, uh, to actually uh, do the exchanges of uh, Bitcoin to fiat. And when it when those coins came to Mt. Gox, Mark had put in place a notification system that warned him that stolen coins were being put into Mt. Gox. So he had actually written a system where he got an alert because stolen Bitcoinica coins were being deposited to Mt. Gox. He just didn't have a system that were watching for Mt. Gox coins, which is a kind of a sad historical irony. How did Mark miss this? Is it because the hot wallet was meant to be, what, depositing to the cold wallet, and he just assumed it was and never checked the status of the cold wallet. Is that how he missed it? I think that's how he rationalizes it, uh, which he is very good at doing. He is good at coming up with the reason why this had to happen. Uh, let's, If we're honest, no, you shouldn't be able to miss any of this. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're keeping hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins, Regardless of if it's your in hot wallet in your cold storage, you should know how much is there. The, and and to come up with reasons for why why you shouldn't feels more like trying to justify why he didn't. So 
Do you think possibly then Mark was aware of what was going on for a very long time rather than it being some kind of last minute panic? That I don't know. And I can't know for sure. I mean, I can't get inside the man's head that much. Okay. Uh, I figure, if I were to guess, it's even money on whether he was aware and trying to cover it up, or if he really innocently and naively was just assuming that the money was really there and it never occurred to him to have to actually look. Uh, he, he's the kind of he's the kind of innocent uh, programmer type where he might just assume that because he wrote the system to behave in a certain way, he would just assume that he keeps working that way and never looks back. That's, that's an actual possibility, I think. Okay. So, so far, is it only Vinick who's been arrested and charged in relation to this? That I'm aware of, yes. And is there any connection between the theft and the laundering? Because everything I've read about Vinick is that he almost certainly was laundering the stolen Bitcoin, but there isn't any direct proof that he was the thief as well. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I... I and pretty much everyone has been quite careful to point out that all the evidence points to the nickel laundering money, or to be precise, receiving money and then passing it on to exchanges and things, which looks like laundering. Uh, there's no direct connection that he would have actually been in the exchange and doing any of the hacking himself. So he was probably just the finance guy in putting, being put in charge of the money laundering. And this makes sense from the point of view that it wasn't just Matt Gox that got hacked and whose money went to Vinick. It was Mt. Gox, it was Bitcoinica, it was uh, other places as well. Uh, at least like three or four different hacks, as well as hacks of individuals. All those mon- all those Bitcoins went sort of through the same network and a lot of it through Vinick's personal wallets. And I don't think Vinick himself personally would have been that active and hacking that many different things. So I think it's much more likely that hacker groups Hackers or hacker groups uh, were the ones that actually broke into the exchanges and stole bitcoins, and then they had an agreement with Vinick for how to launder them and exchange them for cash. Yeah, and another thing I think points in that direction as well is that some of these hacks are quite sophisticated, yet some of Vinick's actions were quite amateur in terms of you know hiding his own trail, right? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's a fair way to put it. Uh, he. He doesn't seem to have put a lot of effort into hiding his blockchain trail, that's for sure. Were any of the Bitcoins that he was laundering recovered? Not to my knowledge. Uh, it's it's not public information what may have happened with uh, US law enforcement when they when they uh, made a bust on BTC. Uh, I don't know if they seized any Bitcoins there. Uh, it's never been anything about it in the news. Uh, my expectation would be that I wouldn't expect any Mt. Gox coins to be recovered from that. Uh, I, I I would rather suspect that they would have been sold or laundered long ago, uh, probably for cash. Right. Specifically because this was so long ago, Bitcoin wasn't worth that much. In 2011, when these thefts were happening, Bitcoin was coming down from its first price boom. And for all anyone knew, that was probably going to be the end of Bitcoin and the price was going to keep declining. Uh, so if you are a criminal mastermind and you're trying to, you have all these Bitcoins, your first thought at that time is probably going to be, well, how do you turn this into real money that is not going to be worthless in six months? Yeah, I guess. Have you tracked any of the kind of 630,000 that were stolen? Have you been able to find kind of like a trail of where they've gone? I can see which exchanges they go to, but without having in internal records from those exchanges to see like which accounts they were deposited to. I can't follow the trail any further than that because exchanges are basically uh, perfect natural mixers. Uh, you you deposit your money, but since it's a shared wallet, it gets mixed with everyone else who also deposits their money. And even just depositing your Bitcoins and then immediately withdrawing them, you, you're statistically likely to have gotten some other Bitcoin back out. So that, that sort of stumps a blockchain investigator because he can't follow the trail because you now are now you're holding different bitcoins oh interesting i'd never thought of it like that so on reflection what are the kind of key most fundamental mistakes that mark made the most stupid things he did that could have prevented all this uh well in retrospect hindsight is always 2020 but the the most egregious 2020 here would be uh monitoring your bitcoin holdings uh mark has made an argument that he 
what he didn't monitor his cold storage because he felt that if you had even the public keys on a live system, that slightly lowered the security of them in case there was any weakness in key generation. That seems like an extremely esoteric risk to worry about while you're basically potentially leaving the door to the vault open and never knowing you've been robbed. Uh, it, it, it would have been the, the much more natural starting point should have been to just watch your bitcoins and make sure that you know the first instant if something is wrong. Uh, apart from just the main theft from the from the hot wallet, uh, the 630,000 that was stolen and ended up in Vinix hands, I think they should have gone public much sooner uh, because both Mark and Jed knew that Mt. Gox was insolvent in, in early 2011. Uh, and had they been public about that, I think a lot more people would have been much less likely to put their money in Mt. Gox and, and keep it there. Uh, it may well have had a significant impact on the Bitcoin market. I mean, Mt. Gox was a significant driver of the Bitcoin market and adoption. But even so, that was sort of based on a lie that Mt. Gox was working properly when in fact it had been robbed very early on and had significant troubles, financial troubles throughout basically its entire lifetime. Well, it's very interesting. It's really interesting. But also, as you're a creditor and you're quite close to it, I think it'd be quite good to just get your opinion on a couple of other things. Can you tell me your thoughts on the CoinLab dispute? Because that is in your report as well. What do you make of that? I mean, obviously, you're a creditor, so you're probably you know, pissed off with Peter Vasenis. But do you give any value or credit to his claim at all? Uh, like you say, I'm, I'm probably biased as a creditor, but it, it seems to be a, a crystal clear bad faith claim from Peter Vasenis. Uh, basically, CoinLab and Mt. Gox, to, cut, to summarize things, CoinLab and Mt. Gox in 2013 made an agreement where CoinLab was supposed to act as the U.S. payment processor and be the interface to all of Mt. Gox's U.S. customers. So all deposits and withdrawals for for U.S. dollars were supposed to go via CoinLab, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they made a contract for that, but it quickly turns out that CoinLab doesn't even have the money licenses required to do this legally. Uh, and when Mt. Gox moves to sort of break the deal and, and it turns out that CoinLab is refusing to return money. So they've basically accepted deposits on behalf of Mt. Gox customers, but not actually, uh, and not actually forwarded them that money to Mt. Gox, instead just crediting their Mt. Gox accounts because they had API access to, to be able to, to do that part, but then never actually forwarded the actual deposited money to Mt. Gox. So that basically amounted to stealing once, uh, once the dispute was in, in process. And when being called out on that, instead of trying to resolve it amicably or anything, Peter's uh, reaction seems to have been uh, to, all right, well, I'm going to sue you for 16 gajillion, majillion dollars uh, in just out of spite. And now that the creditor, now that the bankruptcy and civil rehabilitation, now that the bankruptcy and civil rehabilitation processes are in process, that seems basically just calculated to make sure that no one gets paid until he gets some sort of a settlement out of it, which is basically just holding everyone, all the legitimate victims of Mt. Gox, blackmail. Yeah, so I was wondering about this because I've been looking at it back and forth and thinking, because there was 12 million, right? He did return 7 million, but held on to 5 million, right? What was the reason he held back 5 million? Why did he, has he actually said why he didn't return the whole 12? So yeah, I'm not totally familiar with the entire story, and I can't vouch for the veracity of it. But okay. basically, yeah, the, the story goes that out of the 12 million, he gave seven back and then kept the five because he figured that he was owed that by Mt. Gox anyway as part of the deal. See, I'm wondering if he's putting in such a huge claim that his compromise would be happily to retain the five million. I, I think that's certainly a, a likely interpretation of it. Uh, I mean, there's no way... Anyone would credibly say that, yes, you lost $16 billion because of Mt. Gox cancelling this deal. Even though it was CoinLab that breached the contract by not having the licenses to fulfill its obligations. Uh, so so just throwing that huge number out there, yeah, that seems to be just blackmail. Hold the, hold the creditor process hostage so that 
in comparison to that huge number, then a mere couple of million would seem like an, uh, a reasonable settlement, when in fact, the entire thing is completely baseless from the start, and he owes Mount Gox money. Yeah, I mean, that's what Daniel said to me. Daniel said he gives him negative credit. <laughs> is that It's not even <laughs> even-handed. Like, he should be returning the five million, because that five million is due to the creditors. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then I lastly want to ask you about Brock Pierce, who I've also spoken to. I had a uh, interesting conversation with him. Um, wasn't the it was probably the most heated interview I've had of all of them, and I think I probably triggered him on a couple of points. I think what I really struggle with with Brock is understanding his incentive, um, his the public face of his Gox Rising is very much about supporting the creditors, helping them get as much as they can. And one of his claims was, you know, to raise funds to go after the missing Bitcoin. But somebody said, well, if you speak to Kim, that's zero, no, like little to zero chance of that actually happening. And it's more just smoke and mirrors. So what's your interpretation of Brock, what he's trying to do, and his vision of trying to recover some of the stolen Bitcoin? I really, really don't know. Uh, I I am having real trouble reading the man. Uh, Because on the one hand, Everything that he claims to be about are all very honorable things. Uh, to make sure that creditors get creditors get repaid all the assets instead of them going to somewhere else. Uh, uh, his his uh, promises that he's going to start an exchange and give creditors equity of that to, as a way to gain some additional future recovery. All very honorable things. And, and it would be great if he was actually just willing to join the process and help contribute that. But if you look at what he's actually doing, is is it ends up being more of an interference in the process in that he comes in and wants to say that okay, we're going to start a civil, we're going to start a civil rehabilitation process. Uh, okay, but we already did that last year without you. Uh, okay, we're going to make sure that shareholders don't get paid out from the so-called bankruptcy surplus. Okay, but there hasn't been any surplus since last year. Again, it doesn't seem like he's been following the news or he's intentionally misleading people by repeating old talking points. So most of what he's promising is actually something that creditors have already secured for themselves, uh, which if you combine that with his claims about owning Mt. Gox and things like that, based on some old letters that weren't even, that didn't even turn into an actual sales agreement, because it doesn't make sense. Like, why are you doing all these things? Why are you making all these claims that are trivially disprovable when with just a few tweaks you could have come across as much more reasonable and as a good guy uh, it makes no sense and it makes me wonder if this is all like you say if it's possibly all just smoke and mirrors and he's just trying to get some positive PR as the savior the man who saved Mt. Gox who's been is doing it for the creditors and then banking on that media won't remember to follow up on this and see what actually happens in six months for example and as a creditor, how do you feel about the civil rehabilitation process? How are you feeling about it all right now? It seems to have been dragging on for years, and it seems like you guys do nothing but fight for your right to have your money returned. I, that's kind of what it feels like. It's been a really long and arduous process, and for a long time, we were in this really, really bad spot where where this, uh, there was this surplus situation where due to a quirk in bankruptcy law in Japan, since Bitcoin had appreciated so much in value, there was suddenly a surplus of over a billion dollars that was going to go to shareholders, meaning Tiban, the parent company, and Mark Karplus, which is possibly the worst possible way you could ever resolve the bankruptcy. Like that, That's absolutely 100% the wrong way you should do it. And it was so obviously unfair and unjust, but it seemed hard to sort of find the loophole out of it based on the reading of the law. So... After much fighting and creditors trying to get organized and, and file petitions for it, creditors were able to convince the court to take Mt. Gox out of bankruptcy and back into civil rehabilitation, which allowed them to work around this quirk, basically. So at the moment, there's no surplus that's going to any shareholders. It, it's been it's been fixed. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to take until anyone sees any money back. It might be years. Uh we don't know if the trustee feels that he's going to have to sell more bitcoins, which might drive the market down further. Uh, there's a, still a lot of uncertainty, but as a creditor, my feeling 
when it comes to people like Brock, who just jump into the room and say, all right, we're going to do this. That adds even more uncertainty. Like in the worst case, if something like Gox Rising had appeared on the horizon and they filed their own civil rehabilitation claim, in the worst case, that could have led to there being two completing civil rehabilitation plans, which means that none of them might gain majority, in which case you actually go back to bankruptcy and you're back in the surplus problem again. So, so there's a lot of there's a lot of ways this can still end badly, and and we need people who are very versed in the situation and trying to do the right thing and actually know what the right thing is to try to steer this in in, in the good direction as much as we can. And I don't think that's that's Brock. Uh, he he seems to half of the time he doesn't seem to know what he's talking about, and the other half he he seems to be arguing in bad faith. Well, that was one of the interesting points in my discussion with him because trying to get the bottom to the bottom of his incentives one of them was he kept saying i want to do everything to make sure mark carpellas doesn't receive any money from the bankruptcy of mount gox but from everything i've seen mark said certainly said over and over again he doesn't want the money and also because of the way the bankruptcies and um, civil rehabilitation has been structured now he can't anyway right yeah at the moment none of the money is going to mark mark has said in public that he doesn't want the money uh, Mark is also not in control, so he, it's not like he can make binding commitments. Of, of for example, it's the the owner of Mt. Gox, uh, Tiban, Mark's old company, has bankruptcy claims on Mt. Gox, which is also a complication that needs to be resolved. Uh, Mark's not in control of that, so he can't make binding commitments on behalf of Tiban anymore. But uh, yeah, I mean, no one wants creditor money to go to Mark, including Mark. In fact. A year or so ago, when this, when it became obvious with the increasing Bitcoin price that this was actually a problem, this was going to happen, Mark was one of the persons, one of the people who raised the alarm bell the most. He was talking about it in public, like, this is going to happen unless you organize and oppose it. And because that's, that's what they're saying in the, uh, in the, in the bankruptcy proceeding right now. Most creditors weren't aware of it. So if anything, Mark has done more for the creditors than Brock has. Yeah, I think some people miss that. Um, so I did my interview and I put it up live and, you know, on Twitter and YouTube. There's still some quite scathing remarks and wild accusations against Mark. I've still seen people accusing him of masterminding a, a theft here. And uh, I just don't see it. I I don't see any form of real criminal action by him. It's more a combination of, uh, just like I said to you earlier, he was out of his depth and a bit of self-preservation and um, possibly some incompetence, but nothing that seems criminally fraudulent. I mean, it can still be criminal. I mean, he is still accused of an actual crime in Japan yeah. for manipulating records, which is arguably his way to try to dig himself out of the hole. So that's still up for, for courts to decide. But yeah, I don't see Mark as having masterminded a massive Bitcoin theft where all the Bitcoins went to his secret Cayman Islands Bitcoin wallet or anything like that. That didn't happen. Right? I mean, the research is pretty conclusive on that on that area. But that's never going to stop people from weaving up conspiracy theories and clearly having a lot of animosity towards him because he's still the guy who, if even if you don't think he was personally responsible for everything, then he arguably made it worse by even trying to cover it up instead of coming clean about it earlier on. So, Kim, we're five years on. How do you reflect on it all? Oh, it's been a wild journey. That's for sure. Uh, I don't know when this is going to end either. I mean, that's if anything, that's the only real frustration at this point. In that uh, we've had lots of investigation, we now have a fairly good idea of what happened, although we haven't gotten hold of the actual hackers yet. Uh, but still, the uh, the civil rehabilitation looks like it's going to drag on for quite some time, and then even with all that, on top of all that, we have these bad faith actors that get in and trying to prolong it even further and hold, hold basically holding everyone hostage which just infuriates me as a creditor so what's going to be coming up for you next like how how much are you still involved with the process and are you still kind of looking at data or, or is, is that done for you now i'm not looking so much at data anymore uh, i mean i've never been formally involved with any of this uh, it, was all, it was always just a hobby project so uh, as with all hobby projects, eventually you need to uh, get back to focusing on, on, on your real job as well. Uh, so uh, 
it's been an interesting ride for me. Uh, I spent a ton of time investigating Mungox. Um, learned a lot of interesting things. Now, not looking at it so much. Uh, hopefully, there'll come a point in the next couple of years when people won't need to remember Mungox anymore we'll, and will probably be past it all. Unless Brock Pierce launches a new Mt. Gox trading platform. Well, in that case, maybe that can be the beginning of a news story instead. That would be that would be, that would be better than everyone having to keep obsessing over the original Mt. Gox. Yeah. Okay, just to finish up, um, I do really appreciate your time and your flexibility because we've moved this around a few times. Can you just tell people how they can keep in touch with you? Um, tell them the kind of work you're doing and uh, who might want to get in touch with you as well. Uh yeah, I mean, most of uh, most of my research on this uh, it goes on my blog, uh, on wissec.jp. I'm on Twitter, Wiss Security. Uh, I don't put out a lot of stuff in Bitcoin research these days, but I'm definitely reachable uh, on on Twitter. Reach out via the website. Send me an email at uh, kim at wissec.com if you're looking into stuff on the blockchain and you could use an extra opinion, uh, especially on the older stuff because that's basically where i focus most of most of my time uh i i tend to call myself more of a bitcoin archaeologist more than an analyst i think that's an apt title well listen look thank you for coming on appreciate your time and thank you for doing the report i will share both the uh hard copy and the version where you present it because i think it's it's interesting to read but it's also interesting to see you present it but yeah thanks kim thanks for coming on and i might be in tokyo soon so if i am i think we'll uh we'll catch up yeah, thanks very much. Nice coming on. Okay, so how was that? What did you make of Kim's thoughts? Not only with regards to the different hacks, but his thoughts on Jed and Mark. And have you read the report? As I said in the intro, there's a link to it in the show notes. It's definitely worth checking out, especially the presentation where he talks through it. A lot of it went over my head, but still, it's very interesting to see built up this kind of chain of events, which ultimately led to the collapse of Mt. Gox. What I found was quite interesting too, especially against some of the hate that I've seen towards Mark since I've announced I've done the interview or published it, is that Kim also questions what he would have done in the same position. And, you know, you, you have to ask yourself these things. I asked myself, you know, would I have come clean at the very first hack or would I have tried to recover or rebuild the business? And I can't say 100% what I would have done. And I think that's probably the same for a lot of people. But yes, I hope you enjoyed the interview and I hope you've enjoyed the series of interviews so far. If you would like to discuss with me, you can email me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And also, just a huge thank you to everyone who supports the show, especially the sponsors, including Kraken and Cash App, who've helped make this all happen this week. If you do want to support the show, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Make sure you listen to the ad, especially the advertisers helped me get out to Japan last week and do the interview with Mark. If you don't want to listen to the ads, there are a number of ways you can subscribe to the ad-free version. You can go to patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. It's $5 a month. I've got 83 now. It just ticks up every week. It's so cool. But if you want to get an ad-free version, sign up there. If you don't want to use Patreon, you've got two options. You can pay in crypto. If you want to do that, drop me an email. I'll give you an address to send Bitcoin to, and I'll add you to the distribution list. And you can do the same with Lightning Network. I've now got a tipping.me account. Just use that. You can become a show sponsor. I'm completely sold out for the next few weeks, but I do have some slots later in the year. If you're interested in that, drop me an email on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. We can have a call, talk about some options for you. You can leave me a review on iTunes or click on the subscribe button. Both help with the ranking of the show. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Medium. I'm at what Bitcoin did on everything. But my personal Twitter is at Peter McCormack. DMs are open. Feel free to get in touch. You can check out my website. That's www.whatbitcoindid.com. And you can share the show out with your friends and family. Okay, so next up is Brock Pierce. That'll be coming out tomorrow. <laughs> Quite a fiery interview. Kind of a strange one, but yeah, I look forward to getting that out. And the final one on Saturday will be Andy Pag. If you've got any questions, as I said, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. 